Today we're discussing five different types of salt. Sea salt, salt substitute, kosher salt, table salt, and Himalayan pink salt. Which one should you be using? Stay tuned. I'm Dr. Blake Schusterman. I'm a board certified kidney doctor. I'm also the cooking doc. And everything we talk about here today is just information. Nothing we talk about is medical advice, of course. I am a medical doctor, but I'm probably not your doctor. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share so you never miss a new recipe or a new health tip. If you're using salt to season your food, you're probably using sodium chloride. And unless you've been following me and paying close attention to me for the last few years, you're probably using too much for your health. So today we're doing an extension of a live episode I did a couple weeks ago, and we're talking about all things salt. The most recent recommendations tell us to stay below 2300 milligrams of sodium each day for our health. But the average American consumes 3,400 milligrams each day. Many of you probably eat way more than that. Lucky for us, the sodium nutrition information is on every single packaged food that you buy. Unlucky for us, we're not born with a mouth to brain food nutrition calculator. That would be pretty cool. You take a bite, your mouth sends a complex taste signal to your brain that allows you to calculate exactly the nutrition information in each bite that you eat. It tells you when to stop, when you're getting near your limit. That would be amazing. Since we don't have that magical sensor in our mouths, we're stuck doing the calculations in our head or by keeping track of exactly what we eat throughout the day. So I recommend, you know, instead of doing that calculations and sticking to a real specific number, most people can maintain good sodium health habits by keeping that anywhere between 1500 and 2300 milligrams of sodium a day. And rather than calculating, we're just looking at estimates but it can truly make a huge difference in your health. Now let's get back to the different types of salt. Kosher salt is the salt I use most of the time. It's sodium chloride and it's nice and coarse so I can pick up a tiny pinch with my fingers and add it to my food without overdoing it. An interesting fact I just learned from Bon Appetit magazine because I was looking at the history of kosher salt is that kosher salt got its name because historically it was used because it was really effective at kosher and meat which is the Jewish process for preparing meat for consumption if you keep kosher. The larger grains of the kosher salt would draw out the moisture from the meat, which was part of the koshering process, and it worked better than other types of salt. Thus, kosher salt. The health benefits of kosher salt? Eh, not so much. In fact, there really are none. Though the large grains of the kosher salt allow a teaspoon to have a little less sodium than a teaspoon of table salt, there is really no health benefit. From a flavor perspective, and that's real important, some people say that kosher salt, because it's refined, it loses some of that extra flavor, that complex flavor that you may find in some of the unrefined salts. And we'll talk about them a little bit later, things like Himalayan salt and sea salt. But those other unrefined salts may retain some extra minerals. And those extra minerals give you a little bit better flavor in the mouth. I don't notice it, but it's probably just because my flavor palette it's not that sophisticated. Number two, Himalayan pink salt may now be my absolute favorite salt. And I've really come to understand the cult following associated with it, but not from a health perspective. It's pink, beautiful, tastes delicious, but it is not any healthier than the other salts. I choose it because it has a nice crunch, a well-rounded salt flavor, and it makes a great conversation piece. So much more exciting than white salt. I did just read something interesting about it. Apparently it has the highest amount of plastic microparticles in any salt, maybe just because of the way it's harvested, but that's just another reason to use a small amount. I'm not sure that the health benefits of using another salt because it has less microparticles of plastic is any different than using the Himalayan pink salt. Now, as far as the health benefits of the Himalayan pink salt, it does have a tiny bit of extra minerals that the other salts don't have, but that is not going to give you any health benefits. There's just not enough of them in there. Just like most of these other salts, it is mainly sodium chloride. In fact, it is more than 95% sodium chloride in Himalayan pink salt, so there's not enough of those other minerals to make a difference. Now, before we get to salt number three, have you ever noticed that professional chefs always salt their food from high above? Use that, you know, real fancy little motion. Well, the reason they always give is that it helps spread the salt crystals more evenly throughout the dish. That way you don't get one bite that's really salty and one bite that's under seasoned. 
I also think that a technique like this will help you use less salt in the long run. Because if you have even seasoning throughout, if you take a bite, you're not going to get an under-seasoned bite. And if you tend to get an under-seasoned bite, you may add extra salt. So by keeping that salt and sodium flavor even throughout, you're probably not going to add extra salt when you eat the food. So salt from high up. It looks cool and it's probably a little healthier too if you just use a little bit. Number three, regular table salt is this fine sodium chloride that you are probably familiar with. It has been mixed with and often sprayed by potassium iodide, which makes it really interesting. And that sounds weird, but it's actually an amazing global health initiative. This tiny bit of potassium iodide, and when I looked at it, it is 0.006% of the ingredients in here, is enough to help people around the world avoid iodine deficiency, which can lead to thyroid problems and has been quoted to be the single most preventable cause of intellectual disability. Now, personally, I almost never use table salt, but I do get enough iodine from other processed foods. If you never eat any other processed foods and you never use table salt, you may need to make sure you're getting enough iodine in your diet. Let's talk about sea salt next. Sea salt is made from evaporating seawater and is usually less processed than the table salt and the kosher salt that we just talked about. It also contains traces of other minerals just like that Himalayan pink salt, so it may have a more complex flavor because of those other minerals. Now sea salt is almost 100% sodium chloride, so I wouldn't ever qualify it as any healthier. It has the same risks as regular table salt and should be limited in exactly the same way. An interesting fact about sea salt, when it's harvested from different bodies of water throughout the world, it can have different flavor profiles and different textures. We should do a sea salt taste test. Get different sea salts from all over the world, taste them, and see if we notice a difference. What's your favorite type of salt or sea salt? Let me know, comment below. Lastly, let's talk salt substitute. I've got two of them here. Most salt substitutes are potassium chloride. Some, like this one, are 100% potassium chloride, and some, like this one, light salt, is 50% potassium chloride and 50% sodium chloride. Potassium, if you've never heard me talk about it before, is one of those minerals that has tremendous health benefits for most people unless you have chronic kidney disease. If you have chronic kidney disease, you can't get rid of that extra potassium. So you don't wanna be dumping potassium chloride on your food because that blood level can go way up. For everyone else though, extra potassium can lower your risk of stroke and cardiovascular disease and actively lower your blood pressure. Some people even think that a higher potassium diet is actually more important than a lower sodium diet when talking about trying to manage your blood pressure and maintaining long-term health. I've done a couple other videos about potassium chloride in the past. Make sure you check them out. But there are a couple things you should know about potassium chloride. First, the flavor is different. I'm not always a big fan. Second, if you have chronic kidney disease, you probably never want to use these salt substitutes because the risk you could develop high potassium in your blood is too high. Talk to your doctor to learn more. I'd love to hear comments about salt. Leave them below. There's also a really interesting controversy about potassium chloride going on right now. The government is giving food processors the option to substitute sodium chloride with potassium chloride in the foods that they process. Now, the thought is that if more of those processed foods are higher in potassium instead of sodium, it may have long-term health benefits for the majority of the population in this country, which is a great thing. The problem, and something the kidney community is trying to address, is that that is going to lead to increased potassium levels in almost all of the foods that you eat. So there could be definite risks for people who have chronic kidney disease and may limit the number of foods that they can eat from the grocery store. Fascinating stuff. I guess, if you're a nephrologist. Thanks so much for watching today. I'm Dr. Blake Schusterman. I'm a board certified kidney doctor and I'm also the cooking doc. Check out my website, cookingdoc.com. Check out my book, The Cooking Docs, Kidney Healthy Cooking, a modern 10-step guide to preventing and managing kidney disease. Make sure you like, subscribe, and share. Comment below. I will see you next time.